Hi, Melissa here from Pottsville and Cabarita Physio. I've got a small webinar for you today on diet and inflammation and what you can do to help reduce the inflammation in your body. So let's get started. Unresolved low-grade chronic inflammation is a pathological feature in a wide range of chronic, chronic conditions and you can see here is a list of them. The ones that we see mostly as physios and exercise physiologists is here the arthritis and the joint pain, also injuries. The problem on a cellular level of inflammation is that inflammation actually induces oxidative stress and it reduces the antioxidant capacity. So inflammation brings about these free radicals and these free radicals will actually want to steal electrons from our healthy atoms. So a healthy atom here, you can see we've got two electrons. The free radical only has one, but it wants the second and it will take it from the healthy atom. And this causes problems, disease, um, pain, etc. Antioxidants, on the other hand, have got three electrons, but only need two. So they willingly give one of their spare electrons over to the free radicals. So in this way, it's neutralizing the free radical and leaving that alone so it's not um, upsetting our healthy atoms over here. So ideal world, we wouldn't have so many free radicals, but in the world we live in, we do, and we can address that as well. Um, but if we have lots and lots of antioxidants, it'll actually counterbalance it. So there's two ways of looking at it, trying to reduce the free radicals and also increase the antioxidants. So this is what's happening with inflammation at a cellular level. What other things can cause inflammation? So toxins in the environment, for example, the cleaning products that we're using, pollution that we're inhaling, being overweight actually produces inflammation. The older you get, you get more inflammation, unfortunately. Over-exercising, certain foods and drinks, and we'll talk about this in a minute. And of course, stress. Stress is a biggie in our lifestyle where we're all you know, trying to do too much, trying to fit in too much, and just under that low-grade chronic stress. So getting this under control, whether it's with a breathing practice, a mindfulness practice, a meditation practice, this is really a topic for another webinar, but certainly getting your stress under control will definitely help with your inflammation. We're here today to help you um, with things that we can modify, and we're gonna talk about diet, and consequently weight loss as well. So here are some foods that are pro-inflammatory. So you can see in the pictures there, all the processed foods, those bakery foods, coconut oil, 92% saturated fat. So the coconut oil is a bit of an exception because it does have lauric acid, which is a medium chain triglyceride, which is really good for us, but it still has such a high percent of saturated fat. So a little bit in moderation is fine, but we definitely don't want to be overdoing it. Cooked red meat and processed meat is pro-inflammatory and also increases your risk of bowel cancer. So although we're not advocating to become vegetarian, we definitely want to be having some meat-free meals during the week. With dairy, the saturated fat is not absorbed in the pr presence of the calcium. So a little bit of dairy is okay, but again, we don't want to be overdoing it. We don't want to be overdoing any food group, really. Um, so really important with the glycemic index, and I'm sure you've um, heard about glycemic index, that's how quickly food breaks down. So how quickly sugar is dumped into your blood. So low GI foods are like our fruit and veggies, our whole grains, our legumes, High GI foods are like your white bread and things like that. Really important with sugar, we all know that sugar is pro-inflammatory, that there's really no need for us to be having sugar in our diet at all. So when you're doing your shopping, if you can look at the label and see if sugar is in the first three ingredients, it, it don't, don't have that product basically. So processed food, and all food on the ingredient label is listed in order of how much is in it. So if it's majority sugar, then that'll be first. 
And so each ingredient is listed by the, the biggest percent comes first and then next and next and next. So when you're looking at your ingredient label, the order of those ingredients becomes really important. So certainly if sugar is in those first three ingredients, put it back on the shelf. And sugar comes in many forms. So basically anything that's got OSE on the end, glucose, fructose, sucrose, they're all forms of sugar. Now, the omega-6 and omega-3 essential fatty acids is really important. So originally, we were meant to have a ratio of omega-6s to omega-3s, one is to one. But our Western diet currently, research suggests it's more like between 15 to 17 is to one. So we've got a lot more omega-6 in our diet than we do with omega-3. So again, it's a two-pronged approach. We need to be reducing the omega-6s and increasing the omega-3s. So we'll talk more about that later on as well. Unfortunately, alcohol is pro-inflammatory. So if you do drink al alcohol regularly, what I would suggest, and it's not always easy, but two weeks, just two weeks, try giving it a complete break and see what difference it makes. So if you're suffering with hip OA or knee OA, just maybe have a think about what pain levels you're at. So maybe on a score of zero to 10, you might be thinking, or well, on a normal day, the best I am is three out of 10, the worst I am is seven out of 10. And track that for a few days, then give up your alcohol for two whole weeks, and then track your pain scales again best and worst for a couple of days after that two week period before you recommence drinking alcohol and just see if it makes a difference. And if it does make a significant difference, then maybe it's just not worth it. And if it doesn't, well then you know alcohol isn't the problem for you. But what we recommend is definitely less than two drinks per day, definitely no more than four drinks at any one time, and absolutely a minimum of two alcohol-free days. So that is very conservative, really, maybe one or two glasses on a Friday night and the rest of the week alcohol-free would be perfect. So they're the things that we can't have. And when I'm talking to people about diet, I often try to focus more on what you can have. So filling the plate with the things that you can have, not so much on what you're missing out on because it's just a, a mental shift. It's better to focus on what you can have. So there are food that really helps inflammation, helps to reduce inflammation. And certainly fruit and vegetables, especially vegetables, are on the top of the list. So there are recent studies that show only 7% of Australians are getting their recommendation, their recommended five serves of vegetables a day, 7%. So that is just not good enough. We need to work towards getting that up to more like 97% of Australians are getting their recommendation of vegetables. Vegetables are just so important. Fruit important as well, but obviously with the higher sugar content, we need to be not overdoing that. Our whole grains, so our low GI whole grains, and our nuts and seeds. I'll just pause here for a minute. There is a link here at eatforhealth.gov.au and that's the Australian government guidelines for what, what we should be eating, basically, our dietary guidelines. It's a summary, so it goes into a lot more depth there if you're interested. Now we talked about antioxidants before when we were looking at what inflammation does on a cellular level. So we know we need to get more antioxidants into our system to stop those free radicals from doing lots and lots of damage. So here are some antioxidant foods, some of the top ones, acai, goji, artichoke, cinnamon, apple, cranberry, pear, pecan, plums, pomegranate, and also we haven't got on there blackberries and blueberries. So you can see here predominance of that purple and red kind of colored vegetable with a few others thrown in there as well. So here's a few more foods that are rich in antioxidants. 
so I won't read them all out. I'll just pause for a moment so that you can have a look through. We need to be getting these foods in our diet every single day. Free radicals, just as an aside, um, really promote aging. So if we want to look younger and um, firm up our skin and all of that, as well as reduce our inflammation, then antioxidants are definitely the way to go if you needed a little bit more encouragement there. So some plant food have chemicals in them that protect the plant. So it protects against bacteria, fungi, viruses, cell damage. And some of those compounds and chemicals can also help to protect us. So there are some vegetables that are antioxidants, but also can contain micronutrients and other compounds that can help reduce inflammation. And here you can see there's uh, some more pictures of things that we should be getting in our diet every day. So really important here, and you would have heard this before, is trying to eat the rainbow. So really filling our plate with veggies and veggies of lots of different colors because that way we're getting that antioxidant effect, the anti-inflammatory effect, and also those other protective compounds. Now this is a really interesting one. We talked before about maybe trying to reduce our red meat intake a little bit, and what we could swap that out for is legumes. So there's evidence to suggest that just four serves of legumes a week will reduce your inflammation by 40%. So that's huge. 20 grams is one serve, so you can work that out. Legumes are also really good for your gut because of the fiber and the prebiotics. So it's really helping your gut flora as well. So it's a real, it's a double, it's a win-win. So what legumes, what are legumes? Lentils, baked beans, cannellini beans, red kidney beans, um, chickpeas, all of those and getting the ones in the tin are fine if you don't want to, you know, buy them dry and soak them. Either way, um, they're both still really effective. So definitely we need to be getting some of these in our diet every week. So we talked a little bit before about our omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. So we know by reducing all those processed foods and saturated fats, we're going to reduce our omega-6 input. Then we also need to increase our omega-3. So remember before we said the ratio of the standard Western diet is 17 to 1, and we really want it to be 2 or 1 to 1. So we've got a, a lot of work to do here. So increasing omega-3s in the diet, we need to consume these daily. Omega-3s are not only good to neutralize those free radicals, helps decrease the inflammation in the body, but they're also great for your brain, your heart health, and your cognition. So oily fish are the number one way of getting omega-3 fats into our diet. Mackerel, tuna, sardines, salmon, and the canned versions are fine. Other, if you're a vegetarian, other ways you could get omega-3s, flax seeds, walnuts, soya products, chia seeds. So there's quite a number of ways that you can get omega-3s into your diet. But really important to know that you don't have to be going and buying fresh salmon. You can certainly be just getting your tinned sardines, your tinned mackerel, so much cheaper, but just as effective versions of your omega-3s. Now other ginger, so a quarter to a half of a teaspoon every day, so chopping up some ginger, putting it in your stir fry, you might have, um, I like to have a lemon and ginger tea, however which way it goes in, uh, you might have a juice, juice some ginger with some oranges, apples, carrots, something like that but ginger will certainly help decrease the inflammation. And the big one that we've all been hearing about lately is turmeric, which is also good for your blood sugar control if you happen to be diabetic as well. So here the dose is a little higher. So we're looking at needing up to 2,500 micrograms of curcumin, which is what the active property in turmeric is, 
per day. So if you can see here, there's only about 200 in one teaspoon, you can see you're needing to have a lot of turmeric. So it doesn't tend to be that practical to get 10 teaspoons of turmeric in your diet. So certainly we recommend um, eating turmeric, putting it in your stir fries, turmeric lattes, that sort of thing. But quite probably if you've got a lot of inflammation in your body, you'll need to be supplementing. Now, an interesting note here is if you are taking turmeric, um, supplements have black pepper in them already, but if you're eating turmeric directly, add black pepper to whatever you're having because it increases absorption by 2,000%. So that's really interesting. We definitely need to be having it with black pepper. Turmeric is also a blood thinner, so if you have any bleeding disorders, then obviously that's not for you. This is one of the supplements that we recommend, the Bioceuticals one. Um, you know, it's, it's a really tough one with supplements. There's hundreds on the market. It's not well regulated. So if you are taking supplements, you need to make sure that you're taking something that really is evidence-based. You can see here with a review of the literature, there's pretty low evidence for glucosamine and chondroitin. So this is interesting because a lot of people are taking this. So what I recommend to you is if you're taking it and it's helping you, keep taking it. If you're taking it and you're not sure, maybe have a break for two to four weeks. Like we did before with the alcohol, rate your pain scale, best and worst for a couple of days. Have a break from your supplements for two to four weeks, rate your pain scale again and see if it's made any difference. And certainly if your pain scale goes up, then keep taking the supplement, it's working for you. Fish oil supplements are a little different. Um, they're really great, especially if you're vegetarian again and you're not getting quite enough omega-3s in your diet. Um, but you can see here the recommendation is, is about 2,600 milligrams per day and you can get this in 150 serve of salmon. So you can quite easily get your omega-3s through diet. Um, there, there is evidence to show that fish oil is not as effective as actually eating the fish, certainly for the heart and brain health benefits. So if you can, definitely get your fish oils through dietary means. If you're not, certainly take a fish oil, but know that it's probably not going to be quite as effective. And just a question we always do get asked is about mercury with the big fish. So this is why we recommend having your tinned sardines and things like those little fish that aren't going to have that mercury build up. So just mixing that up so that you're not getting, not just having tuna, for example. So we touched at the beginning on weight causing inflammation. So fatty tissue itself actually releases pro-inflammatory chemicals. So that is just so interesting. Just having fat creates inflammation. So, you know, we always talk about weight loss because of the stress on the joints, because of the load through the joints. So certainly we need to get your weight to an ideal level to take the load off the joints. But this is something that a lot of us just aren't aware of, that that fatty tissue is actually making inflammation as well as increasing the load, which increases the cartilage deterioration. So that's a real two really good reasons why we need to look at reducing your weight a little bit. And it might be only reducing it by 10% to start off with. Just as a quick aside, I often get asked about intermittent fasting. So I thought I'd just put up a few little pros and cons for you. So intermittent fasting, it's been a very popular, everyone's probably heard of the 5-2 diet where five days of the week, you know, you're eating basically whatever you like and then two days you're on a very restricted um, calorie counting intake. This isn't something that I recommend. What we really want you to focus on is just eating clean, nutritious food every meal. So of course, you know, I'm like a 90-10 person 90% of the time I'm going to be really good 10% of the time I'm going to treat myself but if you're only treating yourself that 10% of the time 
all that other food is going to look after you. It's when those treats become more like 50-50 or even more that it becomes a problem. So if you are considering intermittent fasting, the easiest way to do it is the overnight fast. So we all fast overnight anyway. That's why breakfast is called break fast. Um, but if we can make that period just a little bit longer, you'll have a lot more benefit. So intermittent fasting has been shown to reduce weight more effectively than an energy restriction diet, but only just. Intermittent fasting is really good for our gut health as well. So you've probably heard of leaky gut and gut dysbiosis and all that bacteria in our gut. This will help with that. It's good for reducing lifestyle diseases. So um, diabetes is one of these. And the easiest one is the overnight fast. So most books, if you read them, will recommend 16-8. So it's eating in an eight hour period and then fasting for 16 hours. But the research shows there's still positive health ramifications of having an 11 hour fast. So 11 hours is pretty doable. If you think about maybe finishing or you're eating at night by seven o'clock or eight o'clock, and then just fasting for 11 hours and having breakfast, you know, later the next morning. So you're still getting to have your breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You're just having breakfast a tiny bit later and dinner a tiny bit earlier. And certainly during the fasting time, you can continue to drink water and herbal teas. But it is really important, even if you are fasting, you still need to make the good food choices the rest of the time. So as we've spoken about, the clean, nutritious choices. So intermittent fasting works by um, reducing cell stress. So what happens is the body is so intelligent. If, if you're not getting enough glucose into the body, the cells actually self-program death. So all the bad cells, the damaged cells, will actually die and get, you know, sent through your system and excreted. And it'll increase the produ production of antioxidants. So you're getting that antioxidant benefit, which we've already heard about, but it's also like washing away all those damaged cells. There's a really interesting video here um, on telomeres. Maybe I'll just link to it now and we can have a quick watch of it. So you just have to be patient with me here. Oh, it's still loading. Here we go. So really interesting, isn't it? We definitely want to be maintaining our telomeres. 
and it has been shown that intermittent fasting can help maintain those telomeres. So obviously there are some negatives with fasting and this is more when you're really um, trying to do like your 5-2, your restricted calories, which I don't recommend. You're obviously getting very hungry, you're getting headaches because you've not got enough really um, glucose in your system. You're eating, some people eat junk food when they're not fasting because they feel like they're doing so well with their fast. Some people don't have the energy to go about their normal day and it's difficult to maintain. So these negatives I really find are more associated with that 5-2 style of fasting. But if you start with 10, 11 hours of fasting overnight, and possibly if that feels good for you, you might be able to build it up. That's certainly an option for you, which has obviously got a lot of health benefits and may also help with a little bit of weight loss. But um, it's certainly not the only way. Certainly just by cutting out the processed foods and the sugars and the alcohols, um, and increasing your exercise, which we can help you with knowing what is the right exercise for you, then you're going to find that you're going to lose some of that weight anyway. So less stress on the joints and less fatty tissue producing inflammation. So to just summarize everything, what do we recommend? You could have just skipped to this from the beginning, but it's good to have all the information. So I think that intermittent fasting is a really great idea, just having that longer fast overnight. We definitely, definitely need to be increasing our fruits, our vegetables, especially those antioxidant rich vegetables. And remember, we want to be eating a rainbow of vegetables, so lots and lots of different colours. We want to be increasing our nuts and seeds in our diet. Our legumes, remember, 40% reduction of inflammation with just two serves of legumes a day and your low GI whole grains. Definitely increasing your omega-3s, preferably through food sources. Ginger, again, through food sources. And turmeric, possibly you'll need a supplement for that. What are we trying to avoid? So we're decreasing our red meat and processed meat. We're definitely decreasing alcohol. Sugar, we want to get rid of altogether as with processed food and refined carbohydrates. And as we mentioned before, and as you saw in the telomere video, we definitely need to be getting our stress under control. So I hope that's helped and given you a little bit of information. Of 